Thank you very much for the opportunity. Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My apologies to the conference organizers. It was circumstances way beyond my control. I couldn't be here earlier. Um, I'd like to speak about Neville Alexander, the political philosopher, the philosopher of, of liberation. I got to know, like many of you, Neville Alexander on a personal level so many years ago when I was a teacher in the Western Cape and Omni, I was also a college lecturer. And at the time, the new government in uh, the Western Cape tried to merge colleges of education coming from different ethnic backgrounds. And there was a lot of fighting and infighting, suspicion, paranoia, and hostility. And it was impossible then to manage the college given these, uh, these different backgrounds and also agendas at the time to, to sabotage the process. So at that time, I discovered that maybe I should call in uh, Neville, and he came in. Uh, he was a bit wary of the, the exercise because he, I couldn't clearly define to him what exactly it, it is that I wanted him to say. All I could say to him, the people are fighting, the people are not working together, and it's impossible, and we are recreating a, a party here, uh, you know, in a big way at this new college of education, and, 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 and I really don't know what to do. It was at that time, Neville spoke off the cuff, and he, he was absolutely brilliant in his presentation at the time. And when I started to question him afterwards, do you remember I was engaged in critically my background is philosophy, so I ask questions all of the time. And the amazing thing is, as I engaged with him, Neville couldn't understand the things that I reminded him of that he had actually said during the presentation. And uh, that was so typical of my um, engage, uh, engage, the nature of my engagement with him. He tended to forget a lot of things and he depended on you to remind him of what he had said and then he becomes self-critical in the process. Mike, did I really say that? It was bloody mm -hmm. stupid of me. I said, no, it was, yeah, you know. So it's on, on that level. But I wanted to engage Neville because uh, I felt that, as I say, my background is political philosophy. I wanted to learn more about Neville, the political philosopher, the one who raises questions, the one who's not afraid to confess, profess his own ignorance, the one who's not afraid to step back and say, this is as far as I can go and beyond this I cannot lead you. I was particularly interested in the question of a socialist alternative. Now I wasn't here early this morning so I don't quite know how the discussions went. But I'm, I suppose you're all familiar with his critique of the new South Africa as a result of what happened in the talks, the transition talks, his disillusionment, his disengagement from formal politics and also the criticism that he received as a result of that because he felt, people felt on the ground that he had more to offer. Okay. So, it's, so he left it to me and said, well, if you say I'm a political philosopher, then please, you need to convince me because I'm not really sure that I do have. <laughs> I took that as a personal challenge many years ago, and I thought I'd use this occasion just to share some of the ideas that I have had in engaging with him in trying to articulate Alexander's political philosopher within the context of South, Southern, and African, and also so-called third world politics. Uh, the life of Alexander as a student, as a teacher, as a scholar, as a language practitioner, a political commentator, a uh, revolutionary activist, has been inspired over the years by a fundamental moral vision of a unified non-racial South Africa, the normative foundation of which has been the principle of socioeconomic equality and political freedom for all South Africans. Pinning his hopes for the historical realization of national liberation on the revolutionary potential of ordinary working class people, Alexander never had any hesitation in identifying the South African liberation struggle with struggles across the so-called third world, the developing world, in order to impress upon his audience and his readers the global nature of human suffering experienced by the victims of, of European colonial rule, so, evocative, so evocatively referred to by Franz Fanon as the wretched and the damned of the earth. Um, I just don't want to go into this right now, but then he talks about, uh, uh, as I said, I don't, I don't have time really to go into his analysis of the post 1994 uh, political situation, most of us are aware of that, but he feels that we have sold out the revolutionary, the social revolution that he was hoping for never really uh, materialized as a result of co-option of, of leading intellectuals, political leaders, and also trade unionists to work along with the new South African government in order to create this new bourgeois government that is mainly appealing to the interests of middle class black and white, to the total disregard of what is happening on the ground. Um, one of the most telling measures of 
uh, of identifying the substance uh, of a scholar such as Alexander lies in the green, not only the relevance of his ideas uh, in, in a, uh, for those in whose name he speaks or writes, but also in the manner that his legacy challenges his generation to take seriously the suffering of those people who through poverty have been rendered the least visible and the least audible in our society today. From this perspective, Alexander certainly proved his, his worth. His basic position is reminiscent of that of German philosopher Theodore Adorno who once declared that the need to lend a voice to suffering, to human suffering, is a condition of all truth. For suffering is objectivity that weighs upon the person and the most personal experience, its expression, can and should be objectively conveyed. For Alexander, the suffering that is most objectively con conveyed in post apartheid South Africa is that of the poor, the dispossessed, the unemployed, the workers, the marginalized, the unemployable, whose plight cannot, in his opinion, be meaningfully addressed or meaningfully improved within the neoliberal structures of the new South Africa. In this regard, his political philosophy is philosophy of liberation, and is reminiscent of the liberation philosophy and theology of the Latin American scholars, such as Gutierrez and also uh, Leonardo Boff. Uh, I'll just quote the latter here because I feel this is closest to Alexander's position. He, he, uh, Leonardo Boff urges us to make a preferential option for the poor against their poverty. And he duly reminds us that all those who suffer, the, the, the poor who suffer, they suffer a grave danger, uh, uh, injustice against their own humanity. There are those who, someone spoke earlier about Neville Alexander and the ontology of trying to understand what it means to be human, what it means to be human in the world. And then one of those existential categories that is written into being human is the capacity for change. Now we have been told, and someone's also mentioned this earlier about the Tina philosophy coming from Thatcherism, there is no alternative. We have no choice but to buy into this philosophy of neo-capitalism uh, neo and, and economic globalization, and, and, and really we don't have a choice here. Uh, and Neville Alexander actually, his political philosophy is primarily uh, uh, engaged, in, he tries to, to challenge this kind of philosophy. Now I'm particularly interested in, okay, if that is the case, then what is the alternative? What is the alternative? What is your vision? It's cool to be able to say that this is wrong and that is wrong with the present society. What can you tell us? What direction do you give us? Give us some idea of what this post-apartheid, post-capitalist, post-bourgeois situation. What would it look like? How would you, why are you afraid to tell us, you know, given the tremendous incisiveness uh, and the depth and the profundity of your critical analysis with the present government? Um, he chose not to answer this question, which I find, found exceptionally frustrating. He, he never at any, he, he talks about, every, it, you'll see in one Azania, uh, uh, one people, and all subsequent publications. He's talking about the socialist agenda. He's talking about alternatives, but never does he stand back and spell out the details or give us some kind of concrete direction as to what his personal vision is for the new, new, new South Africa. So then I thought, but what he, he does encourage us to do is to engage with, he refuses to talk about the legacy of apartheid. He will talk about the legacy of racial capitalism. So here is an important shift in his thinking because the, 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 the term racial capitalism goes back to a debate that happened in the 1970s between Marxist scholars on the one hand and your <laughs> Anglophone liberal scholars on the other hand. Briefly put, your liberal, English speaking liberal uh, 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 scholars tried to divorce politics from the economy and they spoke of a colorblind economy. And they wanted us to believe that if you leave the economy alone, gradually all the the, 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 all the problems that we associate with the party will eventually just disappear off the face of the earth. Uh, the Marxists, on the other hand, felt that you cannot divorce the political from the economic. The one presupposes the other. So when most people are talking about a post apartheid South Africa, Neville Alexander is talking about the legacy of racial capitalism. Now what exactly, as he go on about this, he, he doesn't want to in any, 
If you talk about capitalism in South Africa, you are talking about racism. And if you're talking about racism in South Africa, you cannot divorce the capitalist economic under uh, the, the structure that informs and supports all of this. So you cannot have one without the other. I remember we had a conference at the University of Stellenbosch last year, and we tried to get Neville to, 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 to um, come and speak to us. At that time, I had no idea just how, how sick he was. And, um, he wanted to know from us what is the theme of the conference. And I said, we're trying to get past this whole thing of rainbow nationism and is there a way that we can conduct this course as human beings in a new South Africa that makes us stop thinking of and identifying and looking at people and saying, colored or so-called colored, black, African, Indian, etc." He refused. He absolutely refused. He said to me, I know where you're coming from, but I will not in any way take part in this discussion. It became quite a heated discussion between Neville and myself, and I said, okay, I'm on my way to Cape Town. I work at UNISA. I'm going to visit my family. Uh, and he said, you're welcome to come and visit me. Unfortunately, Neville uh, passed away a few uh, weeks later, so this conversation never took place. But what came out in my t telephonic conversation with him was, as long as you want to talk racism with me, you cannot talk racism with me and at the same time pretend that all is well as far as economic structures of the new as South Africa is concerned. The two belong to exactly the same monster. So if you want to tackle this, let's not talk about how to identify people. I'm quite happy with calling everybody a human being. That's cool with me. But it's the suffering of people on the ground and the connectedness between the organic intellectual on the one hand and the real existential crisis that people have to experience on a daily basis. Are you capable of relating to that? Are you capable of articulating that? Are you capable of reflecting that? Because if you can, then the two of us, we can speak together. So, yes, I appreciated that and it's sad that he was, I wanted him to come and say it at the conference as to why he didn't want to take part in the conference in the first place, because I felt that that would have been brilliant. He said, see if you can uh, convince me about all of that. I couldn't, as I say, because of circumstances beyond my control. When we talk about the other aspect of, of, of Neville Alexander's um, political philosophy, there's the liberation, and, but there's also the talk of historical justice. And we tend to be afraid to talk about this because of the, all the kinds of rhetoric that is coming from the ANC and the kind of panic buttons that you press every time when you talk about la uh, the, uh, the redistribution of the, of the wealth of this country. When you talk about disposition of land in this country, when you're talking about what needs to be done in order to ensure a sense of historical justice. Now, historical justice is not something that we make up. It's not an academic exercise. It's how people feel as a result of a crime that was committed against the humanity, not just from in the middle 60s, but all the way when the European first arrived in the southern tip of Africa and also further afield. So, I just want to quote something that I shared with him once and because uh, uh, I felt that I, he needed to say more about the land question. There are references in his works with, but I wanted him to spell it all uh, more specifically. This is my um, response to Neville on the question of the land question. The indigenous people of South Africa conquered in the unjust war of colonization continue to remember the fundamental injustice depriving them of the sovereign title to land. The ancestry of this title is from time immemorial. They continue to regard themselves as the rightful heirs of the land and their forebears despite the 1994 transition to the, the new South Africa. The more than three years long history of subjugation, exploitation and oppression in the exercise of the right of conquest of the conqueror cannot be erased from the memory of the concrete peoples of this country by the prospect of a new constitutional dispensation intent on the obliteration of such a memory. The passage of time certainly does not cancel out this injustice and nor will it change it into justice. So when eventually this non-response from Neville, when I wanted, more, I wanted to know more about the, the form of, 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 of this new South Africa that he had in mind, he remained, there was an eloquent silence in this conversation. Then I said, okay, I'll put it into poetry for you. And I was reminded of a poem that Nkrumah had written some years ago when he was faced with a similar dilemma, when 
when, 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 when people around you want you to spell out in concrete terms, what exactly do you have in mind for post-colonial uh, decolonized Ghana? He didn't answer the question, but he, he, he referred to this poem, which I'd like to just to conclude and share with you. He said to his, those listening to him, go to the people, live among them, learn from them, love them, serve them, plan with them, start with what they know and build a, upon what they have. Now, if I say his philosophy of liberation is the philosophy of the poor, then I take the last line very seriously. You build upon what they have. Thank you very much. <laughs>